please stand as we sing our first song, Praise the Hallelujah. Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at New Hope Christian Church. I'm going to start off with a few announcements that are in your bulletin. The first is that we have an events team meeting on February 7th at 6 30. 
That is uh, mainly for planning the 200th year celebration that we're going to be having in September um, to celebrate our 200 years as a congregation. If you'd like to help plan with that event, we'd love to have you join. Um, even if you haven't been to an events team meeting before, if you would like to help us make that celebration and the rest of the year special, then we invite you to come and meet with us in the venue. The TCM mission trip, we had an information meeting last week, and the update on that is just that we need anyone who's planning on going to that Austria mission trip to commit by February 10th and notify Amy Bensey, and her number is in the bulletin as well. Then again, uh, mentioning something to do with our 200 celebration is the New Hope 200, and this is an event that the events team has put together to kind of help build up our anticipation for our celebration coming in September. February 22nd is 200 days before September 10th, which is our 200 years. So we decided to challenge um, you as an individual or a group, maybe your Sunday school class or family, to complete 200 miles of exercise somewhere in the communities in those 200 days leading up to the celebration. This could be swimming, running, biking, walking, um, and it's just a fun way to get out into the community. And we're going to have t-shirts becoming available soon, New Hope t-shirts. So our thought is if you wear those t-shirts out in the community while you're completing those 200 miles, it might spark some conversation with people out in the community and you can kind of tell them why we're doing it um, and just, just to be a fun thing for us to do. So we invite you to do that. If you can look at Psalm 34, 8 through 15, that's inside the bulletin. I'm going to be reading from that this morning. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you, his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. Bow with me this morning as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, prepare our hearts this morning for worship. Calm our spirits as we turn our focus to you in every way. May the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you. May we surrender to your goodness as we gather together in your presence. Lord, bless John as he brings the message. Fill him, us, and this place with your Holy Spirit. It's in your Son's precious name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Grand earth is quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard through it all through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. Far be it from me to not believe. Even when my eyes can't see And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea and Through it all, through it all My eyes are on you It is 
you would, let's stand as we sing the rest of this song. Here we go. Take my moments. Take my moments and my days. Let each breath that I take. Test one. <clears throat> there are times, there have been times when I've come to the pulpit and uh, my concern has been, how am I going to dig us out of the mess we've gotten ourselves into? There are other Sundays when I come to the pulpit and I think, oh man, I sure hope I don't mess up what's gotten started. And today is that kind of day. I, uh, I, f I wanted three scriptures read today. Mackenzie read one. I failed to get a reader for number, scripture number two. But now I look out and I see that I've got my readers here with me. If you've got your bulletin, open it up. Turn to the Philippians reading uh, down at the bottom of the inside page. And I want you to just, we'll read this together. A very familiar passage. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. And today, during the sermon time, we're going to engage a, a passage of Scripture from the Sermon on the Mount that I think is a fan favorite. It is the um, birds and lily, lilies uh, part of the, the, the do not worry section of Jesus' teaching. And, and that's a scripture that's so ingrained in us that w we might not always think it through fully. But this morning, I'd like for us to spend a little time with it. And I will read that section. I'll ask you to stand for the gospel reading. These are the words of Jesus from Matthew 6, beginning with verse 25 on the front of your bulletin. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness and all these things will be, give, be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It's the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Jesus said that to people 2,000 years ago. Imagine how much longer this part of the Sermon on the Mount would be if Jesus did the, did the sermon today. Uh, we, in our culture, we have turned worry into an art form. Uh, worry is structured into our lives. Uh, in, in some ways, anxiety is what drives, drives our culture. And by the way, during the sermon, I'm gonna use the words worry and anxiety interchangeably. If, if you know modern psychology or see counselors, then you know that those terms are sometimes uh, distinguished, uh, uh, distinguished uh, from each other. Uh, if your therapist distinguishes them for you, that's fine. Uh, usually, worry is, is uh, a thought problem. And, and anxiety is something that manifests in feelings and, and, and body, but that's, I don't think that distinction necessarily applies to things that were written a long time before modern psychology uh, came along, and especially when words are translated from one language uh, to another. So I'm gonna talk about those both. Uh, I'll use them interchangeably. Anyway, worry. Uh, uh, think about the role that worry plays in our lives. Worry drives the news cycles, right? Uh, if, if a news service suddenly announced, well, 
Turns out there's nothing to worry about today. Then guess what? That new service would go out of business in a relatively uh, short time because we tune in to find out what to worry about. And in fact, we select the kind of news that we select because we think the way that we select our news gives us the right kind of worry to worry about, right? One group of channels makes the case that our greatest worry is all these woke socialists that are running around in their little deep state that they've got going on. And another set of channels says, you need to look out for all those MAGA racists out there. They've got Florida and Texas under control and they're gonna come after us too. And, and, and worry drives the news. And the thing about worry is it consolidates the constituencies, you know? It helps us decide how to team up together. Nobody's saying, hey, don't worry. It's all going to sort out in a few election cycles. Nobody says that. There's not patience for that kind of thing. W worry always tells us it's the end of the world. Advertising is the art of creating subtle anxieties in our lives, needs that we might not know we had, right? Nobody knows their life is incomplete without the new electric Ford truck until the commercial comes on to tell us that maybe we have that, uh, that need. And advertising is why next Sunday during the Super Bowl, uh, most of our parties are gonna include Doritos, right? How can you do Super Bowl uh, without Doritos? If you don't have Doritos, who are you? That is something to worry about. Uh, I don't need to tell you if you're a parent, but worrying drives parenthood, right? Uh, am I a really good parent if my kids are not signed up for every kind of activity under the sun? Only in the anxious world of, of parenting does a statement like, you know, we had a crazy weekend, the kids were so double booked on stuff. Only in the worrisome world of parenting does that, is that sort of a badge of honor. Anybody else would say, what are you, stupid or something? That you, you have done this uh, to, to yourself. We worry that we might, be not, we might not be doing enough for our kids. And then we worry because we've got too much going on. One worry feeds the other. Uh, let me be philosophical for just a moment and remind you that even our capitalist economic system depends on a measure of anxiety because not enough, we don't, we don't have enough. There's always something more to be added, to be improved or to be uh, discovered. And invention comes out of that discomfort. The economy grows because we are not satisfied. And actually, of course, a lot of good stuff comes out of that dis, dis, discomfort, like, like the drugs that helped Chris fight cancer. However, the more that is brought about can, can really just be more to worry about. How many of you have glanced at your cell phone only to notice 2%? I've only got 2% and suddenly this horrible anxiety comes upon you because you've got to find a cord, you've got to find something to plug into because what if I'm unreachable, you know? I guarantee that nobody gathered for the Sermon on the Mount to hear Jesus that day uh, had, had that thought. They, they just were not as advanced in anxiety as we are. Uh, they probably had no idea of the worry that they were missing, right? Well, the world gives us plenty to worry about, gave the people in Jesus' day 
uh, plenty to worry about, and of course, an abundance of worry for us too. But what does Jesus say about it? He says, basically he says, don't. Life is more than food, and then he offers the examples of the birds who do not fret, but are cared for by God. No one adds anything to their life by worrying. And as to close, he says, look at the flowers of the field. Uh, they do not toil or spin, nor do they, they outsource their clothing to sweatshops overseas. Somewhere the flowers don't have to work that way. And yet Solomon in all his glory wasn't as well dressed as these. And if God cares for the birds and God cares for the lilies, how much more does he care for you? Soothing, soothing stuff. But let me play the, the devil's advocate for just a moment. Is that Bible worthy? You know, I'm, I, can we imagine maybe Dr. Phil saying something uh, sort of like this? And if you can get that kind of warm and fuzzy advice on uh, the TV without having to shower and get dressed and wrestle the kids to get them, get them here. Isn't that just an easier, easier way to do things? Is this just low-level therapy? I don't always do this, but early in the week I listened through a couple of online sermons on this passage and I was sort of struck in listening to, to sermons that this this is the kind of teaching that can be offered up just as sort of a low level comforting uh, sort of therapy. Uh, one of the preachers referred to his sermon as a congregational counseling session. Hey, are you stressed? You know, don't worry. Uh, birds Lilies, chill, you know. I always get a little bit worried when a passage of scripture uh, starts to sound a little bit like a Hallmark card <laughs> uh, with all the warm and fuzzy stuff because in the gospels, uh, Jesus seems not to be all that much into sentimentality. The same Jesus who said this about birds and flowers told his followers, hey guys, uh, they're going to kill me. And you can be sure that if they kill me, they're going to kill you too, which seems like uh, a little bit of an anxiety uh, producing statement. Jesus wasn't always that into warm and fuzzy stuff. And then think Think the illustration all the way through. Uh, the sparrow doesn't always fare so well, right? I mean, a couple times a year, I'll step out the front door and see that an unsuspecting bird has flown into the storm door and he now rests in peace on my front, front porch, right? And... Uh, same is true of the flowers. I have noticed that there aren't any lilies toiling and spinning uh, the last few weeks, but that's because winter took them out and they await their resurrection in the spring. I think birds and flowers might worry a little bit if they sort of knew what the, the, the full story was. But I, I think the... the the pop psychology approach to scripture and the Sermon on the Mount especially is a rather common approach to it. Where the Sermon on the Mount becomes this prescription for happiness on earth and in that uh, interpretation of Jesus' sermon, the Beatitudes become, the, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, become these secret virtues through which we find happiness. They are the be attitudes, the attitudes to be if you really want to have joy. And the teaching on the law that I talked about a little bit last week when we had Children's Sunday, uh, that passage sort of becomes 
a story of freedom from the law because Jesus fulfilled it, so now we don't have to worry about the law. And then here we have this insight from nature, birds, and flowers that we, what we do is we take what's there in the scripture and we bring it to our context to make us feel a little bit less anxious about the world that we live in. Here is sort of a formula for good life uh, over here. But I think the Sermon on the Mount is much more radical than that. I think the Sermon on the Mount is basically Jesus calling us to leave the world that we usually inhabit and join him in the place where he is the king, or at least join the revolution that Jesus brings to the world. Uh, Remember that right after Jesus' baptism, he went public with his ministry, and what he went public with was basically a good news announcement. He said, I have some good news to share with you. And the message was that the kingdom of God was very near, uh, very present to anyone who wanted to get on board with that kingdom. And then everything after that, Jesus' teachings and his miracles pointed to the reality of the new kingdom, which was taking shape around him. And the Sermon on the Mount comes up right after Jesus gets started with that ministry. It's at the front end of his ministry. And I remember how a few years ago as I was reading through the Sermon on on the Mount, it dawned on me that one of the best ways to think of the Sermon on the Mount was to think of it as an inaugural inaugural address. You know, uh, a statement about what a new king has uh, in store for his for his uh, people. And if it is that, it's not so much proverbial wisdom that we bring back into our world to shore up our world and smooth it out a little bit and make us a little bit happier over here. Rather, it is a statement about the new world that Jesus brings, its priorities, and its practices, what the Sermon on the Mount does is it lays out the new kingdom over which Jesus is the king. And and in that inaugural address, the Beatitudes are not really the attitudes to be. Some of them don't even make sense that way. I mean, poverty of spirit and mournfulness are not necessarily things you seek with your life. The blessings are what they say they are. They are what they say they are. Uh, Just happened to think of that football analogy there. Uh, The Beatitudes are blessings. They are honors that the king of the kingdom confers on his citizens. And in the new world that Jesus brings, the broken, the sorrowful, the unjustly treated are honored. They are given a blessing by God. And then if you read carefully through the teaching on the law section that we touched on last week, it isn't really letting anybody off the hook from what the law was all about. Jesus says that in his kingdom, not one little punctuation mark from the law is really going to be undone. What he's calling people to is a, is a deeper, uh, richer understanding of law that is based in uh, love. Love of God and love of others. And then I think chapter six, which ends with the birds and flowers piece, is not so much uh, a band-aid that we bring over here to pacify the anxieties that our world throws our way. It's more like an invitation to leave this world where we get so caught up and enter into the kingdom of God's making. I think a key verse in our reading today would would be verse 32, because after highlighting all the worries about food and about clothes, and a lot of the chapter before this, chapter six, has to do with money, and just think about how many of our worries uh, focus on money. But right after that, Jesus says, 
the pagans run after and worry about these things. So these are the natural worries of pagan kingdoms, which are marked by shortages and hoarding and scheming and all the kinds of conflicts we know. But the kingdom of God is a kingdom resourced by God himself, and so it is a world of plenty. And the section immediately preceding what we read today works in that direction also. Immediately before uh, the birds and flowers section in the Sermon on the Mount is this talk about two different ways of storing up treasures. You're either storing them on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, or you are storing them, your riches, in heaven. Earth pretty clearly refers to the kingdoms of, of this world. Heaven, for Matthew, is not some place that's up in the clouds. It is the kingdom of God, which in Matthew's gospel is always the kingdom of heaven. Heaven is the world that Jesus establishes with his ministry. So it is the kingdoms of this world opposed by Christ's heavenly, but already in a sense present to us kingdom. And a person is always either investing in one or the other, and it's impossible to live in both. I don't think in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is offering up some helpful tips for those of us who might worry some therapies for us. I think the Sermon on the Mount, what it is, it is, it is his off-ramp to another world that is constituted so differently that worry ceases to make sense if you live over here. If in the new kingdom we're living off of God's bank account, uh, if, if we are loved by the creator and so have no worries about esteem, uh, if we know a lot of the chapter six is based on prayer too, if we know that in this kingdom there's somebody who hears us and that somebody is God, then there's, there's much less to worry about. Uh, you know, do I have, do I have, think of the things we worry about, do I have the resources necessary for life? Uh, is my voice heard? Am I loved? And the kingdom of God, the answer is yes to all these things. Those are covered abundantly. Sermon on the Mount was uh, sometime uh, before Easter, but just think how the resurrection uh, undoes worry. Death itself, which is the ultimate worry in the kingdoms uh, of this world, gets upended. Death doesn't reign anymore. Uh, and a lot of people, a lot of people believed that. And they took the off-ramp. And they said, I'm gonna live, I'm gonna live my life in this world. And, and you say, how do you know that? How do you know they exited the kingdoms of this world and chose to live their lives over here? I know it because of martyrdom. Okay? Uh, there were believers who were so worry free that they embraced death for the sake of Christ. Now, that kind of response is unnerving to the kingdoms of this world uh, because death is the ultimate worry that Caesars over here used to keep people. Uh, 
in line. There were, there were crosses uh, across the horizon in the, the Roman Empire, and those crosses were great advertising for the empire because what they said was, uh, fall in line or, or you've got this. Bend a knee or this. Uh, those billboards should, should bring about the kind of anxiety that preserves order. But what happens if even death isn't a worry? The baptized had already been through a death and then had been raised to a new life. And they weren't afraid to die again, knowing that in the kingdom of Christ's making, they would be raised up again. I think, it's, I think this is big, not just, this way of thinking is big, not just for the Sermon on the Mount, but for a lot of scripture because, um, yeah, I'm just freewheeling it here because I want to say this. I think there's a tendency, especially among evangelical types, to reach into scripture, reach into the, the, the kingdom of God stuff and pick little pieces that we think can, oh, we can bring this over and, and shore up uh, the world that we want to have. But I don't think it really works that way. I think the way you know the peace of God is by saying bye-bye and taking the off-ramp to come over to this side. Scripture is actually an invitation to a different world. Uh, at this point, you might be worrying <laughs> uh, uh, by saying, oh no, uh, I worry. Uh, I love Jesus and I worry. Is there something wrong with me? Should I stop seeing my, my uh, counselor about my worries? Should I stop taking uh, the anxiety medicines that were prescribed for me? And my answer to that would be no and no. I think even when we embrace uh, the new kingdom, we've still, we've, we've, we're still sort of stuck in a situation where we've got a foot in the other. And I think becoming a citizen of God's kingdom is a, in a lot of ways like becoming, uh, uh, changing citizenship in, in the world. I mean, oftentimes somebody becomes a citizen in a different place and it takes time to learn a new language and you've got new practices and habits and l laws to learn, new ways of, uh, uh, of living. It, it actually takes a while to naturalize in a new kingdom. And I'm saying that what, what scripture does is it gives us a, a good theological reason for leaving worry behind. Uh, God says you can leave your worry behind. Says he will take care of you. Says that even though there might be times when you worry about death, it has been overcome. Sort of strikes me that worship uh, ends up being the place where we rather fully embrace the kingdom that is over here that's so different from the kingdoms of this world. Where we sing and really mean it is well uh, with our souls. The path to new world uh, in the New Testament is baptism where we die to one world and get raised up in another. Yesterday was a good day. It was a good day. Well, it was a good day for basketball reasons too. <laughs> but <laughs> it was an even better day because yesterday Sally's uh, sister, Penny, uh, came in and with family and she wanted to be baptized here, which was a pretty cool experience. So once again, there was transformation to new kingdom and that's the business we're in. And uh, let's, keep the, let's keep the streak 
going. We're gonna sing a song of response. And if, if uh, you've not dared to step your foot into that new kingdom, the kingdom of Christ making, which, which uh, sort of relativizes all the worries and anxieties we have, we invite you to step forward and do that. Let's sing, let's stand. fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy. your forgiveness before I even do this because you know how you get a song stuck in your head and the whole time I was getting ready for today's communion um, meditation this song just kept coming back to me and I'm like okay so this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine hide it under a bushel no I'm gonna let it shine right how many of you probably sung that in, in growing up in the church? Um, yeah. Um, somebody once told me, instead of using the word light, use the word Jesus. I'm going to let my Jesus shine. So, I don't know, it just, it just come to my mind because I'm going to be talking a little bit this morning about um, the Great Commission. Um, that's, that's what we're called to do. Um, <clears throat> last week, um, Brother Jim shared with us that he was all about putting Jesus into his conversations. Wherever he went, that was a priority for him. Put Jesus into the talk, right? That's what we're about. We're about sharing our Jesus. Um, 
So <clears throat> yesterday, it's, it's kind of weird how things fall into place, but even at a haircut, it can be a chance to share Jesus. Yesterday, I had a haircut. It started out just like most haircuts. I sign in, and you wait your turn. Well, being a Saturday, it was very busy. But my hairstylist was very kind by the time I got up there. She liked to talk about sports and what was going on in the news. Our conversation just kind of spun around those things. Well, basically, somehow during the conversation, I shared with her that God had called me into the jail ministry and that the REC program was part of the program that helped me go into the Bartholomew County Jail and, and multiple jails around the area. Well, she said to me that her minister has been involved in the Jackson County REC and happened to mention the, his name. And I said, well, I know. I've, I've been in the jail with him. And we have um, talked before about Jesus. Well, she proceeded to tell me that he had been after her for several years now to become involved in the jail ministry. And her first thought was, how unusual is this that we're talking about this today? And he had just asked her because there's several RECs coming up um, to, that, I would have to, that our conversation would lead towards that. She also shared some, some deep, deep things with me and that she had been seven years sober. And wow, how awesome is that? I told her that her story is unlike mine. I could, I've never had to deal with addiction, thank goodness. But she could, and she could share that with those who need that advice. Um, basically, a long story short, um, she is now going to tell um, her minister that she's a yes for getting involved in the REC. Um, we often are afraid to say or talk about God's love and plans for each of us. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus gives us the Great Commission. Starting in verse 16, then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mount where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey every, everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We had just talked about this two weeks ago um, in the Bartholomew County Jail. Um, we had just went over these very passages and we just completed the, the Matthew. For those of you who know, that's the end of Matthew. Well, the guys were so motivated by that, the taking that, that they want to continue to study in the Gospels. So we're heading to Luke next, which will lead to Acts. So anyway, um, communion is how we remember Jesus by partaking of the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior. John 3.16 tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So as we draw close to communion, let us remember that we need to let our Jesus shine.
bread represents Jesus' body that was broken for each and every one of us. Let us partake. The cup, which represents Jesus' shed blood, let us partake in memory of him.